So we're going to continue a little bit on the story of Elisha ben Abuya. Remember that we said that uh, Elisha found the Rabbi Meir sitting and learning, and he said, "Me The way that that we, they would strike the conversation is, "What were you What were you talking about?" He says, "I was speaking about the pasuk Vashem Berach et Harit Yov Mereshito." God blessed Yov at his end more than he was blessed in the beginning. And Elisha says, no, this is not how, how you read it. Tov ahari davar mereshito. Something would come out good when the original intention was good. That's why he told him the story of how he was initiated on the study of Torah, that the intention of his father was, I want you to be uh, respected and successful. And I added to that, we added to that, that if, if someone on his own would decide to do something like that, to study or to do good deeds, for the sake of recognition or fame, he might eventually find the right path. But when he's indoctrinated in that uh, direction, from a very young age, it's hard uh, to get out of this state of mind. <coughs> this is what we read in, in Mishnah. When you, when you uh, guide someone from a young age in a, in a certain way, it's very hard uh, to, to break away from it. Also, uh, there's an interesting discussion about education in the Gemara, in Masachet Bava Batra. They say, what, what happens if you have two teachers that are applying to the same job? Ehad garis vela dayik, vehad dayik vela garis. Meaning, one of them covers a lot of ground, but he doesn't review it with the, with the students to make sure that they clearly understood everything. And he re- trusts that, you know, with time, they will, uh, they will realize, you know, if they think that the camel is a donkey, eventually they will realize what, what is a camel, what is a donkey. Or whatever it is that they have to know. The other one is Dayik Velagaris, meaning he spends more time on making sure that everyone understood, and then he moves to the next thing. So the, there were arguments in the Gemara in favor of this, in favor of the other one, eventually they decided accuracy is more important than volume. Why? It says, the, the distortion, once it's in your mind, once you think of something in a, in a wrong perspective, it stays there, it's very difficult to take it out. Today, educators understand that, I mean, which they're trying to apply it in schools. One of the problems that you have in schools is that you have, a, for example, especially in math, there's a curriculum for each year. You move from you know, this level to that level, etc. What happens if a student doesn't fully understand level one? They say, okay, you know, move on to level two and, you know, and, and we'll see what happens. No, it doesn't because there's a certain language that you have to acquire. It's a language of mathematics. If you don't have the basics, if you don't have the foundations, you can't move to the next stage. So uh, the foundations are extremely important. And Elisha ben Avuya did not have them. So anyway, he goes uh, with Rabbi Meir, his student, and um, and he said it again. He tells him, "Umei ita dores shuv." He says, "What else were you talking about?" He says, "Lo yarchen azavus chuchit utmorata kelifaz." This is a pasuk from Mishlei. It says that the Torah is compared to not sorry, is invaluable. You cannot compare it to gold or to glass. Glass was very expensive at the time, not like it is today. The process of making glass was, was complicated. And you cannot exchange it for the, uh, the best golden uh, utensils you have. Meaning there's a, the Torah is a value that's beyond all that. Um, so, uh, Rabbi Elisha asked Rabbi Mir, what did you say about this pasuk? He says, I said that the Torah is as hard to acquire as golden utensils and as easy to lose as glass ones. So now, this is sort of a hidden rebuke to Rabbi Meir, to, to, his, to his master, Elisha. Why? He says, look at you. You've studied all these years, learning Torah, going into really deep levels of, of understanding. This is like getting, you know, uh, amassing the fortune to buy dishes, utensils of silver and gold. But you lost it in the moment. Kelezechuchit. Just, you know, if you drop uh, the, the, the most precious uh, ball of... Uh, is it? 
just in the, now in Pesach, we stopped in the mall in, in Israel. When we were looking for, to buy a gift to a friend. Today, so we're talking about dishes. Obviously, on Pesach, you buy new dishes. Everybody is happy with that. So there was a set of Corel. So I tell the, I tell the, uh, the girl who works there, I say, oh, you know, we have Corel. For many years, it doesn't break. And she says, oh, don't say that. <laughs> she says, I heard that, and, and last week I wanted we to broke. demonstrate to a customer, I held the plate in the air, I dropped it on the ground, you know, right. when Corel breaks, it like a thousand uh, shards, and, and right. very, very sharp. <laughs> so, so that's, that's how you, right? Uh, so I say, if you try to break it, yeah, you'll succeed. I mean, it means it usually doesn't break the way, usual dishes break. In any case, this is what Rabbi Mir tells him, this is how you lose it. He says, don't, the truth is, don't even compare it to glass. Glass, it's, it's expensive, and then you lose it. You could lose it easily. He says, you know, you could use it even more easily, like kele He takes a lower analogy, like utensils of clay. And clay is very cheap. Clay also is porous, so it doesn't hold uh, necessarily what's in it. So Elisha says, you should know that even the greatest scholar runs the risk of losing his faith, losing his knowledge, uh, just like a kliheres. And again, see, again, he rebukes him, he says, but with all due respect to your interpretation, your rabbis would say differently. So what would he say? He says, the, those precious utensils, there's a difference between gold, silver, glass, on one hand, and clay. He says, you know why clay <coughs> is cheap? Because once it's broken, you cannot replace it. That's you throw it away. So that's it. But glass, you could melt and reshape, which people used, today, used to do, by the way. This is recycling. You know, before there was recycling... That's recycling. If you break something that's made of gold or silver and better than even glass, you would reshape it and build it again. Meaning, what he's trying to tell him, why he says, a scholar who went off the deck. He says, if someone who's unlearned, un, you know, not knowledgeable, he doesn't really have where to go away from. And, it's, uh, and there's no spiritual baggage to bring him back. But if you have a spiritual baggage, if you have something that you carry with you as a purpose, and for some reason you uh, digressed, you went off, off the, the path, there's something to bring you back. And just like those utensils that could be fixed. And that in itself is a hint to Rabbi Meir. So why, why is Elisha, if he decides to go for a ride on his horse, why does he have to go back and forth on the promenade on, in, in Tiberia, in front of the Beit HaMidrash. You have the whole shore of Israel. Go to Achziv, you know, the, go up the, up the shore. Why does he have to do it in, 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 in Tiberia? He wants to have a dialogue with Rabbi Meir. He wants to Rabbi Meir to come and seek him out and talk to him because he's still searching. And, and so Rabbi Meir says, Afatah hazor b'cha. So, so, yalla, you know, come back. Amalo eni achol. He says, I can't. How, why, why do you say that you can't? Amar lo, Rukhavet Yarsus Umetela Horebet Amidrash, Beyoma Kipurim, Shehaliot Beshabbat. He says, I was riding my horse not only now, I was on Yom Kippur that fell on Shabbat, like the highest of the highest, and I was riding behind the Bet Amidrash, and I heard a heavenly voice coming out and saying, Shuvu Banim Shuvavim, come back to me, uh, mischievous children. Meaning, God is telling the people praying on Yom Kippur, come back to me. And then, God, or the, this heavenly voice, adds a clause, except for Aher. Everybody's welcome except for Elisha. So he was officially rejected by God. He says, I cannot come back. It came from him. He heard it. Yeah, yeah that's what he says, I heard it. Uh, Elisha. Elisha heard it. That's what he says. Now we don't know if he, did he hear it, or did he feel it? It's not clear. Anyway, he gyor let home Shabbat. They keep riding, and Rabbi Meir <coughs> walks with him, and they got to the, the border of the city that you cannot pass it on Shabbat. Amar lo Meir, hazor becha shekvar shi'arti be'ikevei susi, ad kan tohom Shabbat. He says, Meir, go back. You're not allowed to cross the line. I, I figured I measured with the, the paces of my horse that we got to the boundary of the city. 
So Rabbi Meir says, Avata chazor becha. So this is a very uh, painful dialogue because everything is, is loaded with those meanings that when the Elisha says, go back, he says, I would like to go back, but I can't. Um, so the uh, one, one version of the story is that they, they parted the ways. Another version is that Rabbi Meir dragged him by force, forced him to go into the Beit HaMidrash, but then when he spoke to the children, to the students, and he says, tell me a pasuk, each pasuk, each verse, for him had a, tra- uh, uh, a negative message, and he got upset and he left. The rabbis commented on this whole encounter. They said, don't do what Rabbi Meir did. It's dangerous. You're going to also be influenced by the heretical opinions of others. And says, Rabbi Meir is unique. They say about him the famous analogy, Rabbi Meir, Rimon Matzah, Tocho Achal, Kelipato Zarag. He found a pomegranate, he ate the grains, he ate the, the, the fruit, and he threw away the shells. Why, of all fruits, they, they speak about a pomegranate? First, because a pomegranate is an analogy for the mitzvot. We say that there are as many mitzvot as there are grains in the, uh, in the, in the pomegranate. But the other thing is that if, you ever, uh, if you're not one of those who buy the, uh, the grain, the pomegranate in, uh, in the Trader Joe's, right? <laughs> If spoiled, if you buy the, if you try to open a, a pomegranate and separate the grains, even with gloves, you know how difficult it is, and that will always be a little of this white, thin film which is very bitter. So the rabbis are trying to say, Rabbi Meir is not an easy job of like you know cutting an apple and removing the, the seeds. You have to go one by one and remove the grains from, and it's not easy. What happened eventually with Aher with Elisha? The, some say that when, when Rabbi Meir died, he atoned for Elisha. Some say that it was Rabbi Yohanan who did it for him. Um, the, the message is important of what, what Elisha and, and Rabbi Meir are discussing here. What they're saying is there's always a way back. And in a way, this, this, um, the Talmud adds that the message that Elisha heard was just to make it more difficult for him. Because in reality, he could have come back. The only, the only sin for which one cannot make the shuva, complete the shuva, is a sin towards another person. Anything that we do to infringe upon the rights of others, God cannot forgive us because he's not a party. You have to appease the other party. But Elisha, all that he did was between him and God. So God says, I'm not, I'm not accepting you. But he says it in order for Elisha to try and come back. And Elisha did live all of his life in this constant quest, trying to, uh, to connect back uh, to God. And you see that, I give an example from a completely different field, um, that, you know, when you look at what happened in the Holocaust, right? Some people say that, you know, now there's a, there's a, there's a scientific research that says that uh, some of the leaders of the Nazis were... Uh, drug users. They use a, they say Hitler used you know dozens of pills daily, and that Gehring was on, on on drugs and other, and the SS soldiers were on drugs, and they were uh, they were all <coughs> sort of uh, um, influenced by their by their drug abuse to that killed their emotions. So I, I discussed it with someone in Israel when I visited, and he says he's afraid to to release that kind of information, because now people will, will say that we can, they can acquit the Nazis of their crimes. I said, no, this is not, this is not a concern. Why? Because uh, people behave differently under the influence of drugs. The same, or when they're drunk. You see drunk people, some, be, some people when they're drunk, they become violent. Other people, when they're drunk, they become depressed and they will become quiet and they just you know, move to a corner or cry. They don't want to do anything. Uh, so when you talk about people like the Nazis, what the, even at a certain point, the drugs, even a person who's under the influence of drugs at a certain point realizes that he is under, the, under that influence and he's trying to break away, but he cannot. So, so what will happen? One of two things. Either he will succumb to the drugs and, and, uh, and w- live and operate the way the drugs tell him to do, or he will take his own life because he does not want 
If he knows, for example, the drug pushes him to be violent, but he doesn't want to do that, he'd rather take his own life. That's number one. Number two, I told him, even if you talk about, we talk about the Nazis, the leaders, the SS soldiers that were trained like that, what will you say of all the collaborators who were not drugged, the Ukrainians and the Lithuanians and the, and the Latvians and the Poles and all these nations that were more cruel, more vicious than, than the Nazis themselves? And how is it related to what I'm saying here? That uh, when Elisha said that if someone had content in his childhood, as a Talmud Hacham, he's a scholar, he studied Torah, he studied values and morals, and eventually he went over the derech, there's always this meaning and purpose in his life that will bring him back. But if one's values, core values, are those of violence and hatred and animosity, then what will happen later in life, whether it's uh, despair with mankind or drugs or whatever it is or seeing that other people are acting with violence will lead him in that direction meaning it's the core of the message of Kirkavod Adam Niglavik yeah it's true also right Hachamim said that that our actions reveal our hidden right our hidden uh, motives and our hidden uh, education that's from Kirkavod oh man one the, the saying of the sages uh so, the message to us is that to never, from the story, is that to never lose hope. Whatever happens in life, to, to not say, okay, I have no, there's no remedy for me, I'm gone. Always say, let me, let me assess the situation, let me see what I can do to mend that and get back on track and do the, the right thing for, between me and God and between me and you.